There's a game that my kids like to play, and it's called Would You Rather. If you've never played it before, it's just a simple card game that gives you a choice, and it asks the question, would you rather A or would you rather B? And most of the time, they're, they're funny, silly things that you would never have to think about. Uh, would you rather have feathers all over your body or would you rather be covered in scales? Would you rather have uh, twice as many fingers or twice as many toes? Would you rather be, you know, dropped off a building with a parachute or buried alive with rattlesnakes? Silly things like that. But everybody always has a different opinion as to which one will be better and which one would be worse. And last week, we talked a little bit about the difference between uniformity and unity. And how uniformity is we may all look the same on the outside, but unity is where we have the same vision, the same passion. And in a room this size with so many different people, we all have different opinions. And one of the quickest ways to notice that we're all different is just to ask a simple question, and you can see the opinions of people. So, for example, if today I were to say we have great news, we're going to be catering a free lunch for the whole church today, and you will never believe who's going to cater this meal. It is our very own Lavernia Taco Bell. (laughs) Some of y'all are going, mmm, tortillas and fake meat, praise the Lord. I'm ready. This is going to be great. And some of you are going, nah, I'll just go home and eat a tomato sandwich or something. Oh, no, no, I messed up. It's not Taco Bell. Actually, it's being catered by the Olive Garden. Now some of you are going, hey, I'm staying now. But then some of you are going, eh, bread, lettuce, noodles, uh, I don't really care about that Taco Bell. Everybody has a difference of opinion. Some would rather have one, some would rather have the other one. If I told you that tomorrow there's going to be a change in the weather... So instead of sunny, hot, and dry, it's going to rain all day tomorrow and be 65 degrees. Some of y'all are thinking, hey, this is the best news ever. And others are going, not tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to the beach. We're supposed to have a picnic outside. It cannot rain and be cold tomorrow. Tuesday, Wednesday, any day, but not tomorrow. What if we told you that in a couple of weeks we're going to have our quarterly church business meeting on Wednesday night, and we're going to bring to the church a recommendation that from now on, everybody who attends worship at this church has to wear a hat. Some of y'all are going, best news ever. I wear a hat six days a week, now I don't have to take it off for church. This is fantastic. And some others are going, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why would you have to wear a hat to church? I don't ever wear a hat. I'm not going to wear a hat in there. In fact, I'm not even coming back no more if y'all do something goofy like that. What if I were to say that we have spent a lot of time focusing on the spiritual health of our church, and so we decide that it's time to become more physically active as a body of believers. So we are going to start exercising together. And we realize that everybody has a different schedule, and some are busy in the morning, some are busy in the afternoon. So we're going to try to pick a time that would be most beneficial so we can get the most people there. And so what time of day would you have the least amount going on in your life? And so we've chosen the time 3 o'clock in the morning. Most people are not that busy at 3 in the morning. So we're going to set up some tractor tires out here in the field, and we're going to flip those around. We're going to do jumping jacks and push-ups and sprints, and we'll pull sleds, and we'll build us a vert ramp wall thing we can climb up. It's going to be the best thing ever for our church, okay? 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, be here. And on the inside, some of y'all are feeling like this right here. This is the best thing I've ever heard. I have been waiting for this day. I don't sleep anyway. I might as well come up here. We're going to hold each other accountable. We can pray before we exercise, as we exercise, when we're done exercising and think we're going to die. This is the key that I have needed to physical health. I can't wait till tomorrow. You don't have to raise your hand, but there's some of y'all in here, and that's how you feel. Bless your heart. (laughs) But the rest of us, we have an internal feeling more like this. Three o'clock in the morning. First of all, I don't know why people exercise anyway, but they sure don't do it at three o'clock in the morning. That's crazy. And so we have these differences of opinion. But today we're going to talk about 
working out, and whatever your personal opinion is about working out at 3 o'clock in the morning physically, there are some spiritual things that we must work out in our lives, and that's what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter number 2. We're going to look at verses 12 through 18. Philippians 2, 12 through 18, three parts of our spiritual life that we must work out if we are going to be able to rejoice no matter what. Number one, we have to work out our salvation. There was a story on the news this week about a 22-year-old Malian migrant who was living in France. His name was Mamadou Gassama. And so Mamadou's walking along, and he sees a situation that is very dangerous, and he decides to do something about it. And so this is what happened. So you can see in this video, this is Mamadou climbing here, and there's a small child hanging off of this balcony. You see Mamadou, and there's a small child. There's the parents trying to reach him, but they can't quite get to him. Almost there. Woo, and he got him. So, you know, if I would have been there, I'd have done something like that too, you know. <laughs> so they're calling Mamadou the real life Spider Man. So he made a physical sacrifice and he was able to physically get a workout, saving that young boy's life. And so what does it look like when we spiritually work out our salvation? Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, <clears throat> as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Therefore means in light of. So he's saying, in light of everything that I wrote in chapter 1 and up until now, chapter 2, in light of the fact that Jesus is our example, in light of the fact that we are called to follow him, in light of the fact that we are going to use our chains for his glory, in light of the fact that to live is Christ and to die is gain, in light of all of this, my beloved, my children in faith, whom I love so deeply, in the same way that you have been obedient, continue to be obedient, not just in my presence, but in my absence. And when you think about this in the image of a parent writing to a child, think about what it looks like maybe in your own home, in your own life when you were growing up, when mom and dad say, go clean your room, and then they come in and they check on you and you're cleaning your room, that's, you know, Fairly good, because you're doing what you were asked to be doing, but how much sweeter is it for a parent to walk in your child's room and expect them to be playing video games or reading a book or taking a nap or just playing, and instead you see them cleaning up the room and you didn't have to ask them to do it? You go, oh man, that's fantastic. When you walk in the kid, this kitchen and your children are taking out the trash, and you go, what are you doing? Well, I'm taking out the trash. Did mom tell you to do that? No. Did I tell you to do that? No. So why are you doing it? Because it was full. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they finally get it. It's one thing when we tell them to do something and then they do it, but it's another thing when they do it on their own. So Paul says, there's all these things that you have been doing, giving and serving and loving and praying and worshiping and sharing your faith and fellowshipping together, and all these things are good, and I want you to keep on doing them, but don't do them just because I'm there. Don't do them just when I'm with you. Keep on doing them in my absence. So don't just do them when I'm there, but even more so when I'm gone, keep doing those things because this is what it looks like to work out your salvation. David Platt, in his book, Follow Me, that our co-ed class is going through on Wednesday nights, he talks about the difference between being internally motivated or simply externally obedient. And he says, you know, it's not that difficult for a person to make it look to the world like they are living for the Lord and they're doing all the right things and they're doing all the things that God has called them to do when in fact on the inside their hearts are far from them. Because it's very easy to just go through the motions. It's not hard to show up at church a couple times a week. It's not hard to pick up your Bible and read some verses for encouragement. It's not hard to wear a Christian t-shirt or listen to Christian music or be nice to other people. For most people, those aren't hard things. But just because you do all those things doesn't mean that you're really following and loving and obeying the Lord. 
Well, what makes you say that? David Platt says, this could possibly be the scariest passage in all of Scripture, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, by any account... If somebody is prophesying and they are telling the future in the name of the Lord, we would think, oh, they must know God really, really well. And if anybody is casting out demons in the name of Jesus and the demon's leaving, then in my mind I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they walk with Jesus, no doubt about it. And if they're doing mighty works in God's name, then I would think they know the Lord and they follow him. And yet he says people that cast out demons, prophesy, and do mighty works in the name of the Lord, there are still some who do not know him. How frightening is that for us to make sure that we really have a relationship with Jesus. And it's more than just going through the motions. Here's how you work out your salvation. Verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Remain obedient. Practice your faith. Work out your salvation. He's not saying that we work for our salvation but we work out our salvation what that means is is you cannot give enough you can't serve enough you can't learn enough you can't live enough you can't do anything enough to earn your own way into heaven it's a gift by grace through faith if we could do it on ourselves we wouldn't need jesus but we do so then what does he mean to work out our salvation first the esv says <clears throat> that we cannot be content with our past glories, no matter how great that they were, but instead we strive to demonstrate our faith day by day. <clears throat> the idea of working something out is, let's say you have a, <clears throat> a catch in your arm, and it's very sore, and so you try to work out that catch, and it's a continual process that you go through. It's not a one-time event. If a farmer is working the soil, he wants to work the dirt, and it's continually it's something that he does every year. A student works out a math problem, so you're going from here to here, but it's something that you are always working on. So the ESV says, too many people have this one-time spiritual moment that they think encompasses all that is involved in Christianity. So when I was 17 years old, I went to youth camp, and I found Jesus there. He knocked on my heart's door. I opened it wide open, and I said, Jesus, come in. And my senior year of high school, I was on fire. I told everybody about Jesus. I went on a mission trip to India that summer, and then I went to college, and I realized that what I did for Jesus from when I was 17 to when I was 18 was all that he required from me. So from 18 until I die, I'm just waiting for Jesus to call me home. I don't have to work out my salvation anymore because I did so much good during that two-year span that I got my quota in and I'm finished. And so he says that's not the picture of what it means to work out our salvation. He said it's here we are on the day that we meet Jesus and here's the day that we're going to meet him again and we continually work on our salvation with him, not working for it, but working out the details, meaning we take what God has given us and we work on it and use it for his good to bear fruit for his glory. He says we do this with fear and with trembling. And the idea is not that we need to be scared. The idea is not that God is the big bad wolf up in the sky and he's looking down at all the little piggies just waiting for us to build houses out of straw or wood so he can huff and puff and blow them all down. The idea is not that God is waiting up there with a big hammer just going, I cannot wait for them to mess up so that I can slap them down. The idea is that we have fear and trembling knowing who God is and who we are. It's a fear and a trembling that means reverence for his authority and his power and for his holiness. It's a way that we look up and we say, God, you are so much greater than I can ever imagine and I am so much less I don't even deserve your love. Too often in our life we have a, 
a misconception. I've heard people talk about, you know, there's the, the God of the Old Testament, and then there's the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament smites and blows up and sets people on fire and wipes them out, and the God of the New Testament is love and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He is the same. He does not change. He still holds us accountable. He still punishes his children because he loves us. He's always shown grace and love and forgiveness. In the Old Testament, they wouldn't speak the name of God. They wouldn't even write it down because that's how much they respected the Lord. And yet we cast his name out like it's no big deal. And to have fear and to have trembling is not a, a cowering fear like we have a monster in the closet. It's not the image of a husband who goes and buys a $65,000 bass boat and forgot to tell his wife and now he has to bring it home and explain what he did. See, that's fear and trembling of the worst kind. This is respect. <clears throat> that sounds really great, preacher, that we're going to tremble at the thought of, of who God is, and we're going to respect him because he is God and we are not. We're going to tremble at the thought of sin and what it causes in our life and the past that it leads us to. But it sounds really difficult, and I don't know if I can do that. Verse 13 for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good. It's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That means that everything within us is not good. And everything that is good that is within us comes from the Lord. And so our desire to fellowship, our desire to love, our desire to serve and to give, and to step out in faith, to trust and obey, all those things come from the Lord and he gives those to us. But then so often we say, I just don't know if I'm strong enough to walk that path. And the answer is, you're not strong enough. So God says, not only am I going to give you the desire, the will, I'm also going to give you the work. I'm going to give you the strength and the ability to do so. We've all heard somebody say that God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not true. God gives us more than we can handle all the time. But God will never give you more than he can handle. That's the promise. And so we continually work out our salvation by trusting him and following him, believing in him. He will never give you more than he can handle. No, he will never give you more than he can handle. Number two, we have to work out our sanctification. Sanctification is a process. We talk about we are justified, which means that we are saved by grace. And then we are sanctified, which means it's a process that God gets us from where we are to where we need to be. And then finally, we are glorified when we see him in heaven. And sometimes the process of sanctification, showing us our faults, who we need to be and who we don't need to be, can be very painful, it can be aggravating, and it can be very trying. So this week, the Lord gave me a great lesson <clears throat> on, let's see, Thursday, I was able to go to the hospital to visit some folks. And when I pull up in the hospital parking lot, I have zero sense of direction whatsoever. So when I go to a hospital, <laughs> I park in the same parking lot every single time. It doesn't matter if there's 10 parking lots. It doesn't matter if they have garages over here and over there. Whichever one I parked in the first time I went there, that's where I park it every time or I may never get back to my car. So I went there Thursday, and the parking lot was totally full. No problem. Peace in the valley. I'm just going to drive around. People are coming out. Other cars are getting those spots. Finally, I see my couple. Okay, this is going to be my car. So I pull in. They're walking down the aisle. I'm really feeling like they're going to be on this side, so I got my blinker on. Okay, my car is here. Their car is there. They're walking past my vehicle. My blinker is on. This is my spot. And this expedition whips around them rolls their window down, and asked them where they were parking, and they pointed over there, and then they put their blinker on and sat there and waited for the people to pull out and stole my parking place. And in my flesh, I thought to myself, if I had a missile, <laughs> I would wait for them to get out of the car, and I would blow that car up. And I wouldn't feel bad. I'd feel really good about doing that. That's all right. Peace in the valley. It's okay, Lord. Obviously, you didn't want me to park there. No problem. So I circle around a few more times. Finally see my couple. They come out. I get right in the middle of the lane, put my blinker on, stick my arm out the window going, hey, I'm going to park over there. And they get in the car. 
And then they just sit there. And they sit there a little longer. They sit there a little longer. So I pull up. I'm just looking, going, you know, hey, just so you know, I'm waiting for your spot. And I back up. Seven minutes they sat in the car. It doesn't sound like a long time. Oh, but it is when you're just sitting there waiting on them. They finally pull out. I go in. I don't know what they were doing. They might have been GPS and where they were going. They could have been having Bible study. They might have been having a prayer session. But I wasn't having it at that point in time. I was aggravated. I pulled in. I went inside. Had my visit. Came back out to my car. And I started it. The most wonderful thing happened. My air conditioner quit working in my car. Peace in the valley. It's okay. I knew what it was. There's some kind of hose thing that comes off sometimes. Air don't work. No problem. I can fix that later. I'll just enjoy some of that natural air conditioning. It's only like 117. <laughs> so I run my windows down. I'm driving home, and I'm talking to the Lord about these things. And the Lord shows me a, a moment of grace to ease my pain. And I drive past Wendy's, and they have 50-cent Frosties. <laughs> if there's ever been a day that I needed a 50-cent Frosty, this was the day. So I pull in the line, and there's seven cars in front of me, which is wonderful because there's nothing more fantastic than sitting in a car with no air conditioning, you know, behind seven cars. And so I sweat up here on this stage, and it's like 55 degrees in here. So you can just imagine I'm pouring. I pull out my wallet, 50 cent Frosty right? I don't even have a dollar. Not even a dollar in my wallet, but I got change. So I start digging through my car on the console. I found 80 cents in dimes and nickels. I want to show y'all, just in case y'all don't believe these stories are true. 80 cents, because 50 cent Frosty, there's tanks, and I got to leave a tip. I want to be a good steward. So I finally get up to the line. Ma'am, took 12 minutes to get to the front of the line. Ma'am, I want a 50 cent chocolate Frosty. I'm sorry, sir. Our Frosty machine is broken today. Oh, no. I couldn't make this up. I couldn't make it up if I tried. So I'm driving home. I'm talking to the Lord. Lord, first thing, people stole my parking spot. I had eye lock on it. I had my blinker on. They took it. Then those people got in there that I was supposed to have their parking spot, and they took forever. Whoa, that aggravated me, Lord. I was not happy about that. Now my AC is not going to work. I know I can fix that. No big deal, but it's hot right now, Lord. I'm not real happy about it. I am soaking wet, and the frosty machine is broken. Okay, so all these things happen to me. And then I go and I sit down in my office, and I'm working on my sermon. And here's our scripture for today, verse 14. Do all things. It's real funny for y'all. I was still sweating without grumbling or questioning. To grumble means to complain in a low tone of voice. To question means to argue with evil intent, negativity, and criticism. So I think for most people, they can say, listen, I'm not a negative person. I can, I can look on the bright side of life. I can see my glass half full. It's no big deal. And if I do see an area in my life that I'm really starting to gripe and complain about, I'll just set me up one of them gripe jars. Every time I say it, I'll put a dollar in there, and I'll get over that real quick because I don't like spending money. So it's no big deal. I can work through this. But the, the hard part is, is we can be positive and we cannot grumble or complain about a lot of things in life. But he doesn't just say some things, he says all things. So it's not hard to say, well, you know what, I'm not going to gripe because it's hot outside because I'll take the sun over the freezing weather any day. And I'm not going to gripe about the grass dying because when the grass is dead, I don't have to mow so much. Fantastic. I'm not going to gripe about the way that my shirts are folded up because I don't want to have to fold them shirts. So I'm not going to gripe about any of those things. But he doesn't just say you can... Pick which ones you don't want to gripe about, and then everything else is free. He says, we don't gripe or complain about anything. Lord, have mercy. What about when somebody steals my parking spot? Nope, not that. What about when the frosty machine's broken? Definitely not. What about when the air conditioner breaks? Nope. How about when somebody spreads rumors about my kids? Nope can't gripe and complain. What about when somebody sits in my pew? That should be illegal. Nope, not even then. What about when I get asked to work at vacation Bible school and they stick me, I mean bless me, with three-year-olds? <laughs> nope, you can't gripe or complain about that either. 
Well, I've never met anybody who doesn't gripe or complain about at least something. But there was one person, and his name was Jesus. Well, preacher, you may not know this, but I ain't Jesus. Me neither. But we're called to live just like he did. Verse 15. So that we may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation among whom you are to shine as lights in the world. Blameless means to have a life that cannot be criticized because of sin. To be innocent and harmless, pure and unmixed with evil. And the word we get there for twisted is the same Greek word we use for scoliosis. And so there was a straight form that we were supposed to be in, yet somehow we have deviated from the original. And so now it is our job to shine bright in this world of darkness and show them what we are supposed to look like. And that's what I want to do. I want to shine bright. I want to live for the Lord. I want to be a city on a hill. I want to make a difference. I don't just want to go through the motions. I want to really follow, really serve, really love, really obey. I don't want to gripe. I don't want to complain. I want to work out my salvation. What do I need to do? Verse 16. Holding fast to the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Holding fast to the word of life means to believe and to follow God's word and be obedient to it. <clears throat> Paul says, I don't want to look back over my life and see all the time that I spent with you. See all the teachings that we did and all the studying. So much of my life I've poured into you and I don't want to look back one day and ask the question, where did I go wrong? Or what happened? Because they were on the right track and yet somehow they veered off. And we can all say, you know, there's been times in our life that we have shown very, very brightly. And there's other times in our life where maybe we have been dimmed some. And so we want to ask the question, what do we do in our lives to make sure we keep shining bright? What are the things that we need to do to make sure we don't fall into the darkness? And these things are always the very simple things. Remember, the main things are the plain things, simple to say, not so easy to do. There's three things that will always be present in your life when you are shining bright for the Lord. You're always going to be praying and walking with Jesus. You're always going to be studying his word, and you're going to be fellowshipping with other believers. When you do those three things, you're going to grow in your faith. You're going to be encouraged you're going to trust, you're going to obey, you're going to want to set an example that shines a light in a world of darkness. Number three, we have to work out our satiation. That means to supply up to satisfaction or capacity. So many people just want to be satisfied. They say, you know, all throughout my life, I just feel a little bit empty, like something is missing. Like there's a hole and a longing for purpose, love, forgiveness, confirmation, success, comfort, belonging, adventure, hope. Paul says, I can tell you exactly how to find what you're looking for, but you may not like it. Verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad, and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me, even if I am poured out as a drink offering. So we all can imagine what a glass or a container full of liquid looks like. And then to watch it being poured out until it's empty. So he says, think about an altar. And they would have the animal there, and they would be burning it. And the sacrifice would be lifting up an aroma to the Lord. And they would pour out either some blood or they would pour out some wine on top of the altar or in front of the altar. And they would pour it all out and it would hit the flames or it would hit the hot coals and it would steam. And that would be a symbol of an offering. And Paul says, I'm being poured out. Everything that I have, all that I am, I'm giving it all for the glory of God and for your faith. And he says, and if it costs me absolutely everything, I am poured out 100%. I'm going to rejoice because I'm doing exactly what God has called me to do. So you see, if you, if you want to find what you're looking for, if you want to be able to rejoice no matter what, if you want to follow, you want to trust, you want to be, you want to be satisfied in a way you can't imagine, what it requires is for you to give God absolutely everything. 
but that's hard. And we say, you know, I like giving God 20% of my life and my heart. That way I still got 80 for myself. Right? I like giving God 50. That way we're equal. We're in partnership. Or, you know, even giving God 90, I still need to have something for myself. Can you give me an example of anybody in Scripture who gave everything and it worked out for them? And so we look at Paul. He gave God everything. He was poured out. And Paul had joy even in prison. And we look at David who gave God everything and he danced and he rejoiced before the Lord. And we look at Stephen before he was martyred giving everything and he shone with God's glory. The way to find what you're looking for in this life and the way to work out your salvation and to be sanctified is to realize that you are going to have to sacrifice everything and make the Lord number one. There is no other way. So we ask the question, are we ready for that kind of sacrifice? Are you ready to be poured out for God? Or Paul says to be poured out for one another and how far will you go? Because most of the time we will only go as far as we're comfortable. And as soon as we become uncomfortable, we turn our glass back over. There was a pastor who asked one of his elder deacons to open up the church service in prayer. And the prayer sounded something like this. He said, Lord, I don't like buttermilk. The preacher looked at him and thought, well, that's a weird way to start a prayer. And Lord, I hate lard. Preacher thought, I'm never asking him to pray ever again. And Lord, I despise plain flour. But when you mix them all together and you put them in the heat of the oven, Lord, I love the biscuits that come out. So he said, Lord, help us to realize when life gets hard and when things come up that we don't like and whenever we don't understand what you are doing, we just need to wait and see what you're making. And after you get through mixing and after you get through baking, it'll probably be something even better than biscuits. Amen. In our lives, if we want to rejoice no matter what, we got to work out our salvation. Not for work out, which means we continue to choose obedience. We have to work out our sanctification, which means we do not gripe, we do not grumble, and we do not complain because the Lord has us exactly where we're at for a very specific reason. We just have to trust Him. And we work out our satiation because satisfaction will only come through complete and total surrender. Lord, today, this is our prayer.